Black History Month is a time to celebrate, to learn, but it's a, also a time to um, have the call to action. And hopefully this is what this session today is about, a call to action. You all, anyone not know what the controversy is relative to Taney Street? Sorry? Scott v. Sanford, right. So Taney Street, we're gonna go through the quick history of it. Um, we have a couple of representatives here from hopefully the city and the Taney Coalition, and please jump in at any point. I'm, I don't profess to be an expert here. Um, that street has been, has had its name for 150 years or something like that. I've lived in Philadelphia for 10 years. <laughs> so who am I to come in and start changing the names of the street? But I think the argument is compelling that this street should be, um, should be changed, and particularly so because we have a scholarship here, the, the Octavius Cato Scholarship, and the relationship between Cato and the controversy of Taney and Roger Taney is too close for us to have this scholarship and do what I consider to be a dishonor to Octavius Cato um, by not making every effort that we can to change the name of this street. How many, how many students in here are Cato scholars? All right, so this is particularly pointed at you relative to the activist part of this, the action part of this, to call to action. So there is a street called Taney. It runs through a couple of districts in the city of Philadelphia. Um, when I first came to Philly, and Monique Davis was the superstar of women's sports, and she ran around the country representing Philadelphia, honoring the city of Philadelphia, and on her, her jersey was the Taney Tigers. And I'm pretty sure that if there was a young Israeli or Jewish girl, she wouldn't be running around with a name called, you know, the Hitler Hell, <laughs> Hellraisers or something to that effect. And so I think to African Americans, the black is particularly poignant that we allow this to continue to happen. So this young lady was really dishonored by, by having this name Taney on her, on her, on her, on her jersey. And so, the name Taney, you know, it runs through the city of Philadelphia. I know there have been efforts to try to change it. It hasn't happened yet. There haven't been enough, um, enough movement to make this happen. But I'm hoping that we, Community College of Philadelphia, particularly, particularly those of you who benefit from the Cato Scholarship, will be annoyed enough that you want this to happen. So a couple of questions, starting with, are we committed to knowing our history? Um, not, it's American history, it's African American history, it's Philadelphian history. Are we committed to knowing our history and understanding how this stands out as a continued symbol of injustice um, in America? Roger Taney was probably the, the, the most premier, the number one white segregationist separatist in the history of the United States of America. Are we fully, are we able to fully develop if we don't understand our history and its impact on this country? Not knowing your history, not knowing where you've been, not knowing where your, your origins are from prohibits you from moving forward into developing as a people. And that's what I believe, and I think that's an essential lesson that needs to be learned here. Do we fully understand the impact of slavery and its impact on the development of this nation and our development as a people? I think the two are integ integ integrally related. Roger Taney, the history of slavery, and how we um, eventually got to the point of a civil war that eliminated slavery. But Roger Taney was right in the middle of that. And he, made, he did everything that he could to um, prevent um, the emancipation of enslaved people. How is Taney Street related to Octavius Cato? Hopefully we can talk about that. And finally, do we honor, dishonor Cato by allowing Taney Street to exist? So, quick history lesson. 1619 to 1863, 254 years of slavery. If you haven't read Nicole Hannah um, Jones, Jones? Um, Nicole Hannah Jones, right, that's what I said. If you haven't read the 1619 Project, you should. It gives us a full history of African Americans and the history of this country and the development of this country. So the first slaves came in 16, the first documented slaves came in 1619, and the first documented enslaved came in 1619, and the Emancipation Proclamation was 1863. So there was 254 years of slavery in this country. I jumped to Haiti. Haiti was the first nation to rebel against um, the enslavers from 1791 to 1804. 
And in addition to that, there was a series of black rebellions here in the United States which engender white fear. And I think that's a key point that everyone needs to realize. So the first Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 was designed to capture the escaped slaves. In your lessons in high school and maybe in some cases in college, there's not a lot of conversation about the fact that this was not a docile experience where the enslaved were happy go getters with their fiddles on the farms of America. There was large scale rebellion throughout the times, particularly in the South, and most of that um, caused this Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. The, the first Fugitive Slave Act allowed those individuals who made it to free states to pretty much have a legal basis to not be sent back to, um, to their owners, so to speak. So with the rebellion of Haiti, you know, an, an unbelievable, <laughs> very violent re rebellion, and, of, and the complementary, if you will, rebellions here in the United States, there was huge white fear. And there was a fear that if something wasn't done, um, eventually there would be a rebellion in the United States of America. So the first Fugitive Slave Act was enacted. Along the way, there were abolitionists, there were free states, and there were, were rebellions. So if you made it to a free state, if you made it to New York or Vermont or some of the free states, you were pretty much able to continue to, 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 to live a free life. And there were those who were enslaved who were born into freedom. They weren't born slave. Not everybody was a slave. You know, that's, that's a misperception. That's a huge misperception that there were um, those African Americans who were either born free or were able to acquire their freedom or were able to escape to free lands and, and establish freedom for themselves. Some of the, some of the um, rebellions were the, um, gave, some of the more, more well-knowns, Gabriel Prosner of 1800 in Virginia, Denmark Vesey, Vesey 1822 in South Carolina, Nat Turner, 1831 in Virginia. So you had this situation let me just see if I can get this here. During this particular time, in 1789, the red states, they were all slave states. So if you made it to one of these blue states, you, you were able to acquire your freedom. 1821, the territories began to expand. The red states, these were all slave states. And then you had the blue states were, were um, slaves that were states that were, um, were free states. And so this was the sequence of times up through 1851. Around 1830, the Missouri Compromise, and this is a key point, came into existence. The US Congress decided a way to manage this proliferation of either free states or slave states. There was an agreement that everything in terms of Missouri, which is right here, everything north of Missouri or west of Missouri would be free states. Free states. All right, so this is, this is just the, the time sequence of how the country evolved in terms of slaves, slave states blah, blah, and free states. Key part to this whole story. So you had a combination of things. You had the Haitian Rebellion, and you know, Haiti gets a, a fairly bad rep now in terms of its economy and where it is as a developed nation. But we need to remember that Haiti, because of its rebellion against the French, was embargoed for over a hundred some years. I don't know the exact number, but I know it's over a hundred years, and in many ways continues to be embargoed. So they emancipated themselves through a violent slave rebellion. There were a number of individually led um, rebellions in the United States. Up in the north, we had abolitionists, and there were free states. So what the US Congress did, because the first Fugitive Slave Act was not strong enough because slaves and the enslaved could get to um, free lands and retain their, their freedom. They enacted the second F Fugitive Slave Act, which pretty much said it doesn't matter where they went. If they were property of a southern plantation owner, they were property. So that begins to set the stage for this concept. Well, it didn't begin, but it reinforced the idea that the enslaved were property, that they really had no rights, no matter where they went. And you've seen the movie 12, what was it, 12 Days of Slave or something like that. There have been movies about this phenomena where slave snatchers, many of whom were right here in Philadelphia, and this is part of the story because Philadelphia was one of the first stops along, along the way to, to freedom, the Underground Railroad. Philadelphia was a huge spot. 
So if an enslaved made it to Philadelphia, the slave catchers knew that Philadelphia was a hot spot for those who had escaped. So I think that's part of the history that we need to know. You know, we're, the city itself is not innocent in this phenomenon. So the Missouri Compromise I explained, and then we had the Dred Scott case of 1857. Key point, Dred Scott was enslaved in Missouri. He was held by a, um, a military officer of the US Army. This military officer moved from Missouri, which was a slave state, to Illinois, which was a free slate, and eventually Wisconsin, which was a free slate. How many of you know this story? Hopefully those of you who studied history, you know this story. At some point, he went back to Missouri, and he married a woman, and he brought Dred Scott back. Just to make the story you know, move along quickly, Dred, he died, and his wife retained the, the rights that he had, retained his property, which included Dred Scott. Dred Scott sued for his freedom because he said, I've been in, in Illinois, I've been in Wisconsin over a period of, I believe, close to 20 years. He had been able to acquire and retain his freedom. He goes back to Missouri and, and um, what was his name, S Smith, Fred Scott? He goes back and he loses his freedom. All right, so he sues, he sues in, lo in the local state court of Missouri. The first case, he actually won. And they said, you know, you've been free for over almost 20 years. You continued your freedom. They then brought it, his, um, he, his, he was then, the case then went to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court overruled the local district court, which of course set the stage. If you're following politics now, you know eventually these things land in the Supreme Court. So it went to the Supreme Court. So once it gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed the state the state ruling, reversed the lower state re ruling, and reinforced the state's ruling, which was that he had to continue to be a slave. So the ruling of the majority opinion was written by this guy. <laughs> nice looking guy, right? Chief Justice Roger Taney. In effect, and I'll read some of this, seven, the, score, the, the ruling was a seven to two opinion. Um, the justices formed the majority and joined, the seven it formed the majority and joined an opinion written by Chief Justice Roger Taney. Taney began the court's opinion with what he saw as the core issue in the case, whether or not black people could possess federal citizenship under the U.S. Constitution. All right, key point. In answer, the court ruled that they could not. It held that black people could not be American citizens and therefore a lawsuit in which they were a party could never qualify for the diversity of citizenship. That Article Three of the Constitution requires for American federal courts to have jurisdictions over cases that do not involve federal questions. I'm gonna skip around. We think that they, black people, are not included in the context of the Constitution, which is really designed for the citizens of the United States. Not included. Are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at that time of America's founding considered a subordinate and inferior class of beings, not even a full person, forget citizenship, not even a full person, who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges, but such as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. I'm gonna skip down here. They have for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. Now the right of the property in a slave is distinctly and expressly affirmed in the, in the Constitution. In other words, it's as much of a piece of property as a person's house or their farm, or their cattle. So blacks were categorized as property through this decision. And effectively, he said, even at the origins of the Constitution, it was never intended for blacks to be citizen. We were always considered to be subjects of, of, of property, for, for the most part. And so essentially, he's saying the whole, the, the core in the essential aspects, legal aspects of Dred Scott's argument had no b bounds in the US Supreme Court because he wasn't a citizen. 
So just on that basis alone, Black's were never a citizen, Dred Scott is not a citizen, the basis of this case arguing that he has not only the right to be a citizen, but the right to be a free citizen was considered null and void by this, by this account. The right of property is, uh, in a slave is distinctly and expressed, affir expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Upon these considerations, it is the opinion of the court that the act of Congress which prohibited a citizen from holding and owning property, remember that second um, Future to Slave Act, the first, the second, the reason for the um, Future to Slave Act was because the enslaved could make it to free lands. Um, there was no laws that allowed that to happen, that once you were property, you were always um, property. You never had a right to, um, to move beyond just being the property of your owner. Upon these considerations, it is the opinion of the court that the act of Congress which prohibited a citizen from holding and owning property of this kind in the territory of the United States, north of the 36th North and 30 latitude line, therein mentioned, is not warranted by the Constitution and is therefore void. So he voids the Missouri Compromise. Remember that Missouri Compromise established anything north of Missouri and west of Missouri were considered free slaves. He vo they void the Future to Slave Acts, um, the mitigating aspects of the Future to Slave Act. So in other words, if you, know, if you were able to escape and, and move to a free territory, you could conceivably retain your freedom. All of that is null and void. And essentially he's saying a slave is a slave is a slave. There's just like no, no getting around, no mitigation of this fact, and that they're property and um, not citizens. So in 1857, what's the Cato connection? The US Supreme Court, did I get any of that right or wrong? Hello, everybody. My name is Maya Brown, and I am part of the Renamed Taney Coalition. Uh, me and my cohorts, of which there are five of us right now, um, have been trying for over four years to get this street name changed um, from Taney Street to Caroline LeCount. Caroline LeCount was the fiance of um, Octavius Cotto at the time he was assassinated. In her own right, she was an activist, a poet, uh, and a teacher over at the what ends up being the Octavio Cato School for 50 years. Um, she, her real claim to fame, which it's a travesty not many people know, is that she was Philadelphia's Rosa Parks almost 100 years before Rosa Parks. So what she did was to read the law, and then she would get onto the, uh, not the subway, sorry. Streetcars, thank you. Uh, we don't have them in Texas. So she would get on the streetcars and then inevitably the conductor would kick her off and she would go to um, police and show them the law that says they have to desegregate them um, and the uh, conductors would actually get arrested. And by doing this, she was able to um, get those streetcars desegregated. I'm actually going to get to that. <laughs> so that's fine. Please stay. In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision. 1857, key point. This is three, five, this is four years before the Civil War. And, and, and to set the stage, the abolitionists have been trying to eradicate slavery for, for many years. Abraham Lincoln, here's a name everybody knows, was willing to eliminate slaves, but he wanted us to leave the country. I mean, that was effectively where his position was. He, he wasn't at the point yet of 1863 where he um, emancipated slaves and allowed them to stay here. So there's still a lot of questions. Those of you who want to get a PhD in history, that's a good question to see whether he was, a, whether he was a, at best, he was a segregationist. But he clearly felt the need to, to um, eliminate and emancipate the slaves. So 1857, once you lose the Supreme Court, there's nothing left. That's kind of the way I see it, it's that simple. There's no other legal aspect or legal avenue for those who wanted to, for either blacks to become free or for the abolitionists to um, promote and eventually achieve emancipation, all legal remedies are done. So the only thing left between 1857 and, 1857 and 1861 was a war. There had to be a war. Philadelphia was a major part of that as well in terms of an Octavius Cato um, he actually recruited black soldiers and was an integral part of helping Philadelphia um, acquire the troops needed to go, I got a veteran guy, you probably know more about this story than me, to go and fight um, for the war. So there, that's another connection. He's a guy that, he's a guy that was considered um, 
I don't know if he was considered a veteran, but he certainly was an instrumental player in the, um, in the war efforts. Um, so, th so the ruling complicated citizenship status for many blacks living in the North cities. As the sitting judge McLean noted, at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, black men could vote in five of the 13 states. So remember earlier I said some blacks were born free. I mean, this made them citizens not only of their states, but of the United States. Black leaders in northern communities, among them Frederick Douglass, I mean, he was an escaped slave, but by that time he was pretty free. Henry Garnett and William Cato, father of Octavius Cato, and attendees at a national conference of Presbyterian and congressional ministers in Philadelphia voiced their outrage to the ruling called the decision, a sin against God and a crime against humanity, meant to degrade and rob free people of color of civil and political rights. The activism of free blacks regarding citizenship is demonstrated through the Negro Convention Movement of 1831 to 1864, in which a national network of blacks worked collaboratively to change laws in America. Their efforts advance that the elevation of the free man is inseparable from and lies at the very threshold of the great work of the slave's restoration to freedom. After Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, a new call to action for Northern citizenship rights and opportunity was pushed forward by the National Equal Rights League and its state affiliates, whose members included a new generation of rising young black leaders, among them Octavius Cattle. So that fight continues today. I'm pretty sure Octavius Cattle would never want to know that in his city there's a there it's you know the guy who enacted this you know horrible Supreme Court ruling has a street named after him. I mean that's an honor in many ways. So of course everybody knows you should know and on election day in 1871 Cato was confronted by Frank Kelly a democratic Party operative and associate of the party's boss who recognized Cato as he walked down the street. Kelly fired several shots at Cato with one bullet piercing his heart over there on South Street. Um, Cato was pronounced dead. A jury of 12, mostly working class men, non African Americans, acquitted Kelly after the close of the 10 day. In 1858, Philadelphia City Council, your city council, <laughs> changed approximately 971 street names. One of those streets was Minor Street, which was changed to Taney Street. Racist leaders in the city of Philadelphia, our leaders, were eager to honor Supreme Court Justice. I don't understand why they would honor him. Why would you honor him other than for that, that court case? They were willing to honor Justice Roger Taney for having ruled in the prior year's Dred Scott decision that African Americans were altogether unfit to associate with the white race either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and, un and lawfully be reduced to slavery for, for his benefit. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, a powerful coalition of black civil rights activists were campaigning for equality. They fought the Civil War and gained the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that ended slavery, overturned the Dred Scott decision, and gained the right to vote for African American men. To me, that fight continues today. Um, throughout the South, there are statues that are coming down at some level or another. This has been an ongoing effort to try to eradicate um, the vestiges of slavery and the memory of white, um, um, not just segregation, but supremacy, white supremacy. And one of those activists was Caroline Rebecca LeCount, who was his fiance, right? Correct. LeCount graduated from the Institute for Colored Youth, now Chaining. Shout out to Chaining. Miss Jasmine, where are you? Raise your hand. All right. <laughs> board member. In March 25th, 1867, LeCount became Philadelphia's Rosa Parks, as just mentioned, when she personally forced the integration of the public transportation system in a heroic incident that took place. Her fiance, Octavius Cato, was tragically assassinated. LeCount never married. She taught thousands of students across her long career as a principal of a public school that was eventually named for her slain fiance. Today, both LeCount and Cato are buried in the same section of Eden Cemetery in um, Collingdale? I'm not, I guess you must know yeah, where that is. Yeah, that's correct. But yeah. she didn't even have a headstone until we raised money to get her one earlier this year. So she was in an unmarked grave for that entire time. So 160 years later, the injustices continue. And the question is, when are, are we willing, we meaning us, willing to stop the injustices of this phenomena, which was the defense of white supremacy in, in, um, in this country, not just the city of Philadelphia, but this country. So unfortunately, what was once Minor Street is still Taney Street, but we have received overwhelming support to rename it in honor of Philadelphia's heroic civil rights activists. 
So that's the story. Of course, there's much more that I would encourage all of you to read about and to find out about, but that's the short version of how we are where we are today. And to me, this is live history as we speak. This is not just textbook stuff. This is about eradicating the vestiges of, of slavery, of white supremacy, of a city that in many ways promoted segregation. The fact that they named that street after Taney um, a year after the Dred Scott decision is horrific. If you haven't studied the Dred Scott decision, to me that's at the core of, of where we are as a people. Because prior to Dred Scott, there was a chance that legally slavery could be um, eliminated. After Dred Scott, after the Supreme Court rules in one way or another, that, that's it. There's no other, there's no other recourse um, but to fight your way out, which is what happened in 1861. 1863, which by the way, the Emancipation Proclamation was not a law, it was an executive order. So it wasn't until the, the 14th Amendment, the 15th, the 14th free the slaves, 15, 14, the 13th free the slave, 14th was Equal Rights Amendment, and the 15th was the right to vote, universal right to vote. Go grabbing my history off the cuff there. No, you so, did a great job. Can please, I say sure. one thing, though? Um, this decision, the Dred Scott versus Sanford decision, was so controversial that it is what precipitated the Civil War. So it caused people in the North who really didn't even care about what was going on, as well as people in the South who didn't care about slaves but cared about the Constitution, um, decided that they were not going to let this stand. And so it, not only was it the worst Supreme Court decision in history, it is the one thing Taney is known for, and it is what caused us to actually go to war. Right. And I think in the history of this country, there's nothing more important than that Civil War. Yeah, the Revolutionary War was important, but it was the Civil War that began to define us as a country, as a nation, as a culture, who we are. We're still fighting that war. We're by far not, any, we're not by far not near, you know, any, 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 you know, semblance of equality and opportunity for all. But the trajectory really started in 1857 when the country just said, you know, when, when the Supreme Court, the law said, forget it, it's always going to be an unequal and two, you know, um, uh, a country with two types of people. Um, we fought a war to get beyond that. We're still fighting that war in many ways. I mean, that's another conversation. You know, we went through probably, going through the top of my head, 50, 56, 75 years of Jim Crow in the South. Um, and then another, we're still fighting the wars of civil, civil rights, much of which is being reversed. So to get back to the earlier part, if you don't know your history and you're not willing to fight for it, what you have, and, and this is Guy Generals the person, <laughs> so don't quote me as Guy Gen President Generals, what you have um, right now as we speak are governors in different states who are eradicating, trying to undo the history of this country, um, particularly in Florida, where they've pretty much eliminated any conversation, any speak of critical race theory and at graduate levels, they completely distorted it. Um, they actually had the nerve to say that, that blacks over the course of slavery actually gained skills. They tried to mitigate it by saying it was a workforce development project. Um, and the same is happening. Florida just eliminated sociology as a core curriculum requirement, saying that it's too quote unquote woke, that they wanted I don't know what they wanted, but they didn't want sociology, which was determined by researchers and historians. Um, so the attempt to unre and the same thing is happening in Texas. The same thing is happening in North Carolina, South Carolina. And quite frankly, much of it is happening right here in Pennsylvania. Um, the Moms for Liberty are all over the Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, where they're trying to take books off the shelves, Rosa Parks books, um, you know, books of African Americans, um, in Florida, parents have to give permission for their children to read um, books of black authors. So I'm going off on a tangent now, but to me, this is all part of a trajectory of activism that we must, we, we must be involved in and we must retain, and I think this is a good first stop. There should be no reason why that street exists. Open for questions, conversation, dialogue. Yes. There's also a bill 
um, being trying to be passed about kids' online safety acts, making the everyone to put in their state ID to access the internet. So you cannot be using or getting information about anything with without an ID online. Because they um, people, Republicans believe that children should be um, limited to what they deem as safe. That, is that Florida? No, it's a federal, but it's, it's a federal act, um, COSA, the COSA Act, to put it in all of the, um, everywhere that's trying to be passed. Great. Yes, sir. To kind of fill in that three years there uh, before Lincoln was elected, uh, Stephen Douglas uh, refused to uh, put forth a uh, slave code for all of the uh, unincorporated territories, and so uh, which eventually led to the election of Lincoln and. When Lincoln was elected, it was because that the South refused to accept the election, the du duly elected president of the United States. I know that sounds familiar um, because it's what's going on today. But they went beyond what happened here on the 6th, which they tried, were unsuccessful, is that... Uh, they seceded, and that is when secession started, when there was a refusal to enforce slave codes in these uh, territories because it would lead to a freedom of black folks as they migrated to these territories. And so they seceded, they created a separate confederacy, and if you read the uh, cornerstone speech by uh, Alexander Hamilton Stevens, it lines up very clearly what the attitude is and how you, your point is so well taken and so important about the Tawny uh, redress of that particular recognition that should be totally done away with in this country. Yeah. <clears throat> if I could just answer one part of what you said, we are talking like this had to do with slavery. That is only true for the South. The South did want, not want to lose slaves because they still had an agricultural economy. The North didn't, for the most part, care about slavery. They just didn't need it because of the Industrial Revolution. So when we're talking about all this stuff, um, it does sound like, because we're relating it back to race, that that's what it was about. It really wasn't about that. Lincoln did not want slaves uh, to be free when he actually had to get to the point where he just needed bodies for the war. He was going to let black people join, but he was very worried about giving them guns. So even because of the Emancipation, Popula Emancipation Proclamation, it was not for the point of freeing slaves. It was the point for winning the war. This is actually just a comment to add about Taney Street. Um, the descendants of Taney living today actually are like, he was racist, you should take his name off of this. Uh, local artist and activist Peter Tan Taney and uh, Joy Taney um, are both like vocal activists about it. So it's like even his own family doesn't want it up. I also know them and I can get you in touch with them. Actually, Joy Taney is on the Renamed Taney Coalition. I assume so, yeah. Um. It's a little bit loud. Um, the question that I wanted to ask is, <clears throat> being a space of like an educational institution, it's there's some we, I think as students, there's, we we aren't really taught about a lot of these things. Like, I went to a friend school um, in media for grade school, and you're not really taught about any of these things in general. And I think, and I'm just curious, like as like a a course of action, would it be like 
available that, you know, maybe in our course curriculum, we have a class where we're educated on these types of things, because I feel, you know, in the, you mentioned about Florida and how they're trying to get rid of this education. Should we here at like community college kind of reinforce and say, Hey, we're going to oppose this and have curriculum and classes that will educate our students in this. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> and, and I say that, so let me switch back to my role as president of this college. I take it very seriously. It's more than just balancing budgets. It's more than just recruiting students. It really is about making a progressive change to the world we live in. I think community colleges, community colleges are the most democratizing institutions in this country, bar none. Um, we make a difference, and I think that history has to be part of the difference, that we have to fight to preserve it. By the way, we do have an African-American studies program, which as far as I'm concerned, doesn't go far enough. It should, you are? Okay. So it should, it should permeate all of our courses. You know, black history, African-American history is American history, and we need to get to that point. So I can go on and on about that, but yes. Somebody else had their hand up? Yes, sir. Is this on? Oh, I had a question. I know you said you've been fighting for the past four years to change the street. Uh, what's like the challenges you face and what can we do about it? Yep. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna stand up for this one. I'm going on a tangent. Uh, it has taken about four years because it is not just Republicans against Democrats. It is a people against an institution. So for the last four years, President Daryl Clark, who is a black man, um, basically has been the one who had the power to change the street name. People have tried to change it before, but when the George Floyd situation happened, there were people who lived on Taney Street who were like, here's an easy win. We can just get them to change the street name. Um, I moved here from Texas 10 years ago and I bought a house in Brewery Town on 27th Street. I took a walk around the corner um, and I looked up and if you see the Taney name, he's only known for one thing. I mean, you know what you're looking at. And I was like, are you kidding me? As a black and Lakota Sioux, the point of me buying a house and then walking around the corner and seeing the Taney Street name made me feel enraged and it made me feel unwelcome in my own country. And that was the point. So uh, I linked up with the people on Taney Street and we started a coalition it was during COVID, so we couldn't do the normal go knocking on doors and get signatures, but we worked with Kenyatta Johnson's office to um, get community engagement. Uh, we got 3,000 online signatures. We held online courses where you could come learn um, about the Taney Street legacy. Um, and then we also didn't just pick um, Caroline LeCount, we asked people, who do you think this street should be named after? And they came up with her as a Philadelphian who does represent excellence and who has done something um, important for this country. So um, now we're in 2022. We have Kenyana Johnson on board. We have Curtis Jones on board. Um, Daryl Clark asked us to do several things that I would say were unreasonable. So if you can prove that the overwhelming majority of citizens are for anything, you should be able to go to city council and say, here's what we want you to do, do it. Um, but they have, it cancel me, can, how do, yes, prerogative, yes. Cancel manic prerogative where they get to decide what happens so there's no real checks and balance system. For whatever reason, Clark, just wouldn't put it on the ballot, which is what we needed him to do in order for the rest of city council to vote on it. He came back to us. He asked us to get a super majority of signatures in the fifth district before he would put it on the ballot. The problem with that is that that's insane. And also nobody knows what the super majority is. So we said, how many signatures do you want to get? We didn't get an answer for that. Um, so we went back out. We got is we knocked on every door in Taney Street, and Taney Street is a long street, three times, and got 94% of people to say yes, they want the street name changed. And the other six were people who were just like, why change a street name? Like, what is this gonna mean for me? It doesn't actually affect people in any way. Um, but we went back to Clark, 
Then Clark said, okay, you need to go to the United States Postal Service and find out what happens when a street name changes. Well, city council already knows this because their job is to change the street names. There's a database in which once it gets updated in the database, it will update everything else. The only thing citizens have to do is to, when they get their license renewed, tell the licensed people that the street name has changed. UPS, I mean, you United States Postal Post Service also told them that. Um, and then we also looked up the Philadelphia law that says that. Um, and then he went back and said that we needed to go ask PennDOT if it was okay to change the name. PennDOT is for federal city council, oh, state, oops, and city council handles the city. So at that point, uh, we waited until there was a city council meeting. Um, and the way that city council works is that you can only speak as a citizen if a law that is related to something you want to speak about is introduced. So we waited until they changed another street name. <laughs> uh, and I got up and I basically confronted him and I said, please tell me what more citizens have to do for you to do your job. It is not okay for a street that is named after a white supremacist who's said that black people, me being one of them, is not human, is standing on a street that I have to walk down every single day. There are six schools on Taney Street full of people of color, full of children who have to walk down that street. And it doesn't even matter if they know or don't know who Taney is. That's not the point. The point is for people to know or think that whoever Taney is must have been a good guy because his name is on the street. Um, at that point, Clark just waited us out. <laughs> so uh, he ended his city council presidency uh, in December without putting it on the ballot. Um, right now, Kenyatta Johnson is the new city council president. He is still on board. Jones is still on board. Uh, and what we are waiting for is to be able to have a conversation with um, Jay Young in order to get him on board because he is the one who has to introduce it once it gets introduced. Um, everything that happens after that is just really um, subsequential. It, so it's a done deal, but we just can't get it to the point where the person who needs to put it on the ballot will put it on the ballot, put it to vote. I know Jasmine has been working the sidelines on this. Come on. In the meantime, this young lady has a question. Um, so Jay is more than committed to putting it on the ballot. I met with him on Thursday. Uh, Councilman Johnson is now our council president. He can put it on the ballot for us. He will. He just wants to make sure everybody's bought in. And honestly, Dr. General Rose is absolutely right. We would need a lot of assistance from our students coming to city council and really following the coalition's lead, but providing some support because this is really, really important to our city. So you will hear from me, you'll hear from Dr. Generals, you'll probably hear from Genevia and Dr. Thomas and Dr. Perkins and Michelle, et cetera. So we're gonna need a lot of effort to show up and show out, but I do. we do have willing council members that are willing to do that. Um, President Clark was always an interesting person. He was great to the college though, since we're recording it. Um, he was always a friend to the college and gave us great allocations, but it was very challenging to move legislation with uh, President Council Clark. So I'm glad that we do have all three that are willing to go and move, but we will need your support as well. Great. Do you have a couple of questions? Oh, hi, I don't know. Um, I never used this before, so I'm just getting a little anxiety. Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to, um, my name is Tiani. My tribal name is Sahira, um, and that's my biological name, so I will go by that um, to introduce myself. Um, I am biracial. My mother is African-American, and my father is Native Indigenous. 
Um, I spent half of a little bit of my life here and a lot of majority of my life at the Yava Bay Reservation in Arizona with my father and the remainder of my family. Um, coming back here, I've, um, I decided to go to school and things of such. I wanted to bring up um, the point about the Taney um, thing. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm very honored to be here before you all. And um, I'm just very honored to be a first generation college student and just learn all these new um, experiences that was never brought to me before in my life. Um, I wanted to channel what you guys were saying about the name change. Um, it was similarities. Um, as you know, a lot of the similarities were going um, similar to um, the, you know, us wanting to get the Columbus statue removed, as well as the name of Columbus Boulevard and things of such. Um, so I've always been in a tw in a twine with both cultures of my family, and um, that was something that really triggered me. Um, it still hurts and bothers me to this day that it's still not removed and we um, it took so many years to even get things, for example, like Confederate flags removed, things of that sort. Um, they, around 2020, when the George Floyd protesting and things like that were happening, um, they were, there were many people vandalizing um, the Columbus statue. And eventually, they um, there were council people and different people that were fighting to get it removed. Um, eventually, um, they had reached the vote that was, um, that was you know, I, um, I don't know how to say that, but the vote that that basically said like, yeah, they wanted to get it removed. Um, however, at that point, um, as you stated before, that there were people protesting, of course, majority of them <laughs> were European descended people. Um, so it was really um, a smack in the face. The only thing that they did was cover the statue. Um, I don't know if a lot of you remember that, where they um, placed the, um, the wooden pallets over the statue to prevent it from getting vandalized further instead of just removing the statue altogether. And um, so this really hits um, home to me. I'm really, um, like I mentioned, for a few years, me and my mother were strange. So unfortunately, I'm now getting back in a twine with a lot of my African-American side of the family, which I'm very grateful for. But um, this is hitting home for me for a lot of different reasons, because I feel like out of the pain on both different spectrums and um, I just try not to get emotional <laughs> but um it it hurts because when I came here um I noticed I was one of the only Native American people that I was around in neighborhoods and schools and anything and it broke my heart so um what I'm trying to do is keep the balance of both my cultures and fight for our, our culture and our people as much as we can and um I just want you guys to know I want to do anything I can to help and support in any way um, thank you. I just wanted to share that. You're going to make me cry. I didn't come here to cry. <laughs> Somebody else had? Did you have, a, you have something to say? I just had a quick question about the date for uh, city Here council. I just want to know when. when uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to know the next dates uh, that students can come and support. Uh, at city council to, uh, you know, help. We're going to have to organize. Hopefully we yes. can continue talking and find out, you know, have a strategy for which, you know, which city council, which date. We're, we are um, jazz left, but I know we have conversations with their their office folks. And Kenyatta told me personally that he, he, he supported it. Um, I, this is such a I don't understand why there's a fight. Again, if there was a street called Hitler in this city, I'm guarantee you that street will be gone by by now so what is the problem well, the other thing if I can ask you I don't get why you have to get the permission of the people on the street other than the inconvenience of an address it's not their street right. and people are transient they come and go they're renters I don't see how the people it's the city's street that's my I don't know maybe there, is there an answer to that? Uh, yeah it's a very simple answer the answer is racism so the reason why the Columbus statue was not taken down is because the opposition to them getting taken down had a certain skin color. And that relates back to what this gentleman says, that there's a lot that you don't know about our history. That is intentional. Christopher Columbus never came to America. He'd never set foot here, and he wasn't the first person in North America. That was a Viking 100 years before him. Uh, so the reason why Christopher Columbus is so important to uh, Irish and Italian backgrounds is that because of the Knights of Columbus, they wanted more people to become Catholic. Um, and at the time, the only people who were Catholic in America were Irish. Irish hated the Italians. So the Knights of Columbus tried to come up with a way to get the Irish to like Italians. 
And they decided the way to do that was to put a whole bunch of Christopher Columbus statues in Irish areas. And the Italians were like, uh, we don't claim him. <laughs> He's not one of us. But if this is going to stop us getting beat up or discriminated against the Irish, well, yeah, let's go Columbus. And then over time, that story became lost to history. And you learned in school, Columbus came to America in 1492. But Columbus is just as bad as Hitler to Native Americans and to black people. He was a murderer. He it was the reason why the slave trade is what the slave trade is. So when you say that there would not be a street called Hitler, that would be because the most people who are complaining about that would be way more light-skinned than the people like me and her who are complaining about Columbus Drive and Columbus Monuments. Hi. Hi. Um, I just, Eden Cemetery, I think, is in, um, is in Sharon Hill. It's over by the airport. Isn't it? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I just have relatives that, that, that were there. But the other thing I wanted to say, while um, we're changing the name of the street, I wonder if there's any sort of recognition of this bogus trial that took place where this man was acquitted of killing Cato. W is there any way to rectify that? I know that this Kelly person has passed you know, away, but is there any way to straighten that out right. so legally? Part of the reason why I feel so strongly about this, part of the reason I feel so strongly about this is really because of the Cato scholarship. I mean, the city is finally recognizing Octavius Cato. The statue went up. May, you know, Mayor Kenny, regardless of what you thought, he felt very strongly. So I'm an educator, and you all, most of you are students. If we were Howard University, there would be a collection of students who would research that very thing. And I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage your, your instructors, um, Dr. Love and some of the other folks. That's a great project to do, you know, to find the original documents, the archives. There's one on Spring Garden. I've never been in there. The Presbyterian Church is another source for uh, the history. His, Philadelphia has an unbelievable history. We barely tap into it. I mean, you could just walk down the street and see the signs of things that, that occurred. So I would, because of Cato and the connection, I'm sorry? Taste of Freedom, yeah. I, you know, I, I would encourage you through your classes, that would be a great student project. That's, you know, the other day, I, you know, during the break, I went to, you know, we didn't have much to do, so we said, I, I like DC. So we went to DC, and we eventually went to Mount Vernon. And I don't, any of you been to Mount Vernon? Okay, so you know there's a black, there's where George Washington is buried, and right next to it is where it, used, it was a potter's field. So now they're starting, you know, they refer to the slave as enslaved. They're starting to find religion, that George Washington was an enslaver. He had probably more slaves than anybody. Supposedly he freed him when he died. That wasn't, he only freed hit the small portion that he had. His wife still had hers. And Anyway, long story short, Howard University embarked upon a project. Their students, where there's a technology through some type of radion, I can't, I'm probably going to mangle what the term is, but there's a scientific means where you can stick it into the ground and you can find through the carbon presence um, human beings. So they were able to go through, it's a huge area, right along the Hudson River, and find where people are buried in this potter's field. And then they found, then they found ancestors of people who were on that plantation, and they were able to connect the ancestors to the DNA. So now they're starting to put, and I got pictures, they're starting to um, put cemeteries. Eventually they'll get to headstones. So, you know, what's my point? My point is the, the history you know, we don't know the history of this country. You know, yeah, Black History Month, Martin Luther King, and, you know, 18, 1963, March on Washington, we know all that stuff. We hear it. But there's so much more that needs to be uncovered for us to fully reconcile the issues of race and the things that um, separate us as a country. So this, thank you. It's my hope that you know we'll organize, we'll get some dates, we'll put a call out. It, you know, I don't know that we need to march to, <laughs> to City Hall, maybe, we'll see. Um, but I think a showing, that's what happens. That's how things get done in this city. I think a showing, I think we have the support of the, the principal council people. I'm sure the mayor will sign it. And um, hopefully we can get this done. And you can put that on your resume, that you were an activist who got something done, who really did more than just 
protested. You actually got something done of significance. Just one last thing that I want to say. Um, this is not about what separates us. This is about what brings us together, because the thing that we do all have in common is humanity. And hate is a hierarchy. It's a pyramid scheme. There is always going to be somebody at the bottom. So you have to have solidarity with each and every single person sitting next to you. And the person suffering the most is the one who is at the bottom of that pyramid. If you look at what is happening in the world today, you have to lift your voice up for the people who are suffering the most. Because if you don't, once they're wiped out, you are going to be next. So don't look at it like this is my black community, this is my native community, this is my Arab community. We are all one community, and that is the only way we're gonna accomplish anything. We have another, yes. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, this Taney Street movement is new to me. I'm familiar with the Dred Scott case, um, but I just had a question, like, as you're on the ground doing the work, what are some of the things, like, how is the history being explained to, like, defend keeping the street name up? Like, what is the opposition even, like, what's the justification that they're describing? Sure. Uh, there is very little opposition, but really it's just most people's fragility of ego. They cannot rectify that somebody would do something like this. Uh, Mervo at the time, all the street names were getting changed back in 1858 was a self-proclaimed white supremacist, as were many of the people who were on city council. They put that up there because they wanted it to be known that they agreed with Taney's thinking. And so today, um, people don't really sit down and think about stuff like that. And they're, they're not supposed to. We actively prevent them from doing that by not telling them the real stories of what we did. They call the Trail of Tears a march of Native Americans it was a genocide. Not many people made it to wherever they were going to put them on reservations. And the ones who did get put on reservations, even if they had a stroke of luck, such as the Osage Indians, there were minerals under their land, they became the richest people in America. So what did the government do? They assigned them, grown people had to be assigned or basically adopted by white people who they then had to ask them for their money. So then the white people discovered if they killed them and everybody in their family, those mineral rights would go to them. So they killed so many Osage Indians that that is why the FBI exists. And so what happens time and time and time again is that enough people are not speaking up right when something kicks off so that by the time enough people care about it and know about it, it's too late. So people have been speaking out about this for years and years and years and years. It was just that it was not enough people speaking out loudly and continuously is the reason why. And the people who say, you shouldn't try to change history, were like, no, we're not trying to change history. We're trying to make it right. You shouldn't know who Taney is. You should know who Caroline McCown is. And I, I think we all know that women, and especially black women's erasure, of their contributions to this country are one of the reasons why black women have the hardest time in this country. So why wouldn't we take this opportunity to talk about how somebody put their life on the line to make the world better for us and have this person's name on the street who was actively trying to make it worse? That, that doesn't hold well for me. So whatever anybody is trying to say in opposition to why the street name should be changed, they're not being sincere. They're trying to uphold the structure. And anybody who's trying to uphold the racial structure in any way is somebody you need to fight back against. Let's give the mayor a round of applause for coming out. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the plug, <laughs> the, the hook, I should say. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. I want you to you know, pay attention to the information that will come out via email or posters or whatever. Um, but I think you know, this is Black History Month. It's a perfect time to start this movement. Um, this is a movement, and, and, and somebody 
you know, the full history, you're right. It shouldn't end with the changing of the street. We should take the opportunity to tell the full history of what happened between 1857 and 1861. I think that's critically important for this country. So I want to thank you all. I think we have a couple of more cookies or whatever. Thank you all for coming out. Please stay tuned, and we'll keep you informed. Thanks a lot.